prescription services coming to local pharmacies. The Hospital Foundation 5050 issues its largest prize ever. And a funeral procession for a slain OPP officer. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Next week, Ontario residents will no longer need to see a doctor to get a prescription for some common ailments. As of January 1st, pharmacists will be able to offer that service. It's all part of an effort to relieve the strain on other areas of the health system. Local pharmacists welcome the new power. Jessica Clement brings us their reaction. Treatment of minor ailments will soon become a whole lot more convenient. Starting on Sunday, pharmacists will be able to write prescriptions for 13 common conditions, including UTIs, pink eye, and hay fever. They will also be allowed to prescribe antibiotics after tick bites to prevent Lyme disease. Robin Despins, a pharmacist at Oak Medical Arts, says that she can see that expanding even further in the future. In other provinces, there are um, more conditions besides what we have, but you have to start somewhere. Um, I think once we demonstrate our ability and the way that pharmacists can really step up and fill a gap for people, really increase access to this type of care for those minor ailments, I think we'll continue to see um, the ministry and the government look to increase that scope even further to include more conditions and more expansion for pharmacists. Despins adds that extra training isn't necessary to prepare for the new service, since pharmacists already have the clinical training and expertise needed to treat minor ailments. Jensen's pharmacist, John Paul Federico, says pharmacy prescribing will help improve the efficiency of the healthcare system and it will help free up doctors to provide care for more complex needs. A lot of patients go to walk-in clinics for minor ailments and um, walk-in clinics fill up quite fast already. People will be able to seek care for minor ailments faster uh, and this will reduce strain on hospitals, on uh, clinics. Pharmacies are expecting an increase in customers once more people know about the new service. But both Federico and Despin say they're prepared for the larger workload. Our workload will increase uh, so we'll have to find ways to uh, fit this in and um, I don't see it increasing drastically because already pharmacists do assessments for minor ailments through over-the-counter products. Um, I can't speak for other organizations. I know at Oak Medical Arts we have four pharmacy locations in Thunder Bay. We're very ready and excited to um, take this on and, and step into this role. So I think um, we've seen it coming so I hope that all the other pharmacists are ready to do that as well. All Ontarians will be able to receive the service free of charge as long as they have a valid health card. More information can be found on the province's website. Jessica Clement, TVT News. Police and municipal officials in Kenora are promising to take swift action to address public safety. This after a series of violent incidents at local businesses that prompted a special city council meeting yesterday. Lee Noonan has the latest. The doors are staying locked now at Island Girl Women's Clothing Shop and customers have to ring a bell to access the store. Owner Michelle Livingston had the bell installed following a December 23rd incident in which a man was charged with assaulting her at her store. I was scared and I did not feel safe. Livingstone shared surveillance video of the altercation on social media as well as live streaming the aftermath. I have to deal with people breaking into my store, drug addicts shooting up, everything else, and this is not right. If you want Island Girl to stay around, if you want businesses in Kenora, then we have to put a stop to this. A number of other business owners spoke at a special council meeting on public safety, all in agreement that crime in the downtown core was making it very difficult to run a business with frequent break-ins and some employees afraid to come into work. Opinions differed dramatically, however, on how to address the issue. In the end, council directed administration to move forward with the community safety and well-being plan and to seek a commitment for increased OPP patrols. The local OPP has said they will be making changes to their frontline response. Going to the regular spots, trying to make sure no one's doing, you know, the break and enters or the thefts, but then we're also trying to drive around and, and make sure everyone's safe and no one's is going to freeze to death or 
or, you know, overdose. Increased police presence is coming with construction already in progress on a new downtown OPP office. And Canfield is optimistic that planned housing projects will help curb the issue. Housing is also a key part of the solution, according to Marlene Elder, co-founder of Kenora Moving Forward, a homelessness advocacy group. The group wants Kenora to model a housing solution after the U.S. city of Houston. They sort of triaged everybody and, okay, all the agencies, who can help? What do this, does this one person need? And then, um, you know, take it further. So I think it really has to, you know, everybody has to support that. It's the community that really has to come together and, and, and help each other as, as neighbors. In the short term, Elder says simpler steps like opening up public washrooms can make a difference. One point that everyone we heard from agreed on was that urgent change is needed. Lee Noonan, TBT News. The OPP had to call in their explosives disposal unit following a traffic stop near, near Kenora yesterday evening. A 28-year-old Alberta man who was also deemed to be impaired was found to be in possession of a homemade explosive device. A firearm, other weapons and drugs were also found in the vehicle. The accused now faces eight charges in all, including unlawfully making or possessing an explosive, several firearms offenses, possession of methamphetamine and impaired driving. Sunwing Vacation says it's sending dozens of flights to Mexico to bring home stranded passengers. Hundreds of Canadians are still stuck in Cancun, including some from Thunder Bay. Meanwhile, after days of travel turmoil at Toronto's Pearson Airport, some passengers are finally getting the bags that were lost there. John Woodward reports. You look like you won the lottery. Oh, no, no, I don't know. Omar Abdullah walked out with presents he'd been meaning to give his family days ago. Finally got my bag, so I'm pretty happy. Got stuff for family in here, so... Um, uh, a lot of gifts, <laughs> gotta give. Wow. Sahib Singh did, did has been wearing his brother Christmas Ivan's sweater? Christmas sweater since he arrived on December 23rd. Uh, he's using my stuff, he's wearing he's my wearing clothes. clothes. All of these among the passengers coming to this facility to pick their bags up in an incredible week of travel chaos. I haven't changed my clothes till then because everything, I, I, I've got nothing. Bags lost at Pearson International Airport thanks to a baggage belt malfunction in Terminal 3 in the midst of a nationwide storm that sent airlines reeling in the busiest travel days of the year. Sunwing was particularly hard hit as they were already cancelling flights that stranded people in Mexico and Cuba, some sleeping on airport floors as they waited for a rescue. Their passengers getting their luggage at another depot. So we had to cancel. My son has autism. It's impossible to stay and sleep in the airport for over eight hours. Um, we are not campers. I'm sorry. Some here hoping for refunds, according to Canadian rules. If a passenger can't get one from the airline, they can appeal to the Canadian Transportation Agency. But their complaint backlog is surging to 31,000 cases, producing wait times the agency estimates are in the range of 18 months. A consequence of complaint surges from travel delays from COVID and repeated shocks to the system, says consumer advocate John Lawford. It's a pretty chaotic situation. And unfortunately, every time the passenger protection regulations, it seems that they're going to get a breather and start to work on the backlog. Then a new issue comes up. The CTA says they're working on it, saying we anticipate that this ongoing review will continue to yield opportunities for process efficiencies and automation. Not everyone got their luggage back. Taylor Ford drove in from Guelph to leave empty-handed. Day five, yeah. Uh, what are you missing? Uh, pretty much yeah, all my clothes that I own, some of my work clothes. I got my whole life in my bag. Hoping he can trust his bags really are out for delivery. That was CTV's John Woodward reporting. Well, an update on a story we brought you earlier this week. The Ministry of the Environment says a diesel spill near Pickle Lake has now been cleaned up and there's no ongoing concern. 6,300 litres of diesel spilled on the roadway when a tractor-trailer jackknifed on Nord Road about 88 kilometres north of Pickle Lake. Officials say the spill was less severe than initially suspected and did not negatively impact any ditches or waterways. The trucking company involved in the crash hired environmental firm GFL to conduct the cleanup. Ministry staff have reviewed the documentation and will inspect the site as soon as possible. It's 11 Jeopardy wins and counting for Thunder Bay-born Ray Lalonde. His total winnings surpassed $300,000 U.S. on yesterday's show, but he had to survive a final Jeopardy scare. 
12,201, leaving her with 1999. Ray Lalonde, living a charmed life, survives yet another scare. With an 11 day total of 311,500 American dollars. That's well over 400,000 Canadian, Ray. Congratulations. Yeah, not too bad for 11 days of work. Lalonde has had some blowouts, but yesterday's show was a tight one. We'll bring you the results of tonight's show, which is the last of 2022 on tonight's late edition. The Boys and Girls Club held its annual Family Fest today. It was an extra special day of fun as it was the 10th time for the event and the first since the onset of the pandemic. Riley McManus was there. There is plenty of fun at the Boys and Girls Club this afternoon at the 10th annual Family Fest. Executive Director Albert Aiello says with kids off school, it's a great way for kids to bridge the gap between Christmas and New Year's. We have KHEP here doing an arts program. We're lucky to have the Thunder Bay Adventure Trails here taking kids on snowmobile rides outside. It's a beautiful day for that. Uh, we have a campfire outside. We have the United uh, Commercial Travelers here running our barbecue. Um, so we have hot dogs and hot chocolate for the kids. Tim Hortons again is another big sponsor as well. Um, so yeah, we're just happy. We're welcoming everybody uh, from the community to come by, spend some time here. Um, it's a well, well, uh, a well attended event we've had I think our we had over a thousand people one year here so so it's a great great thing for kids to do with their families there is also a rock climbing wall bouncy castles foosball and a sketch artist but there was one activity that stood out to the kids my favorite part is snowmobiling um snowmobiling snowmobiling did you go fast yes Adrienne Tessier is with Thunder Bay Adventure Trails. The snowmobile club has been part of Family Fest for the last six years. We have as much fun as the kids do. Some of these kids have never been on a snowmobile in their lives. And to see the smiles on their faces and, uh, and the, the glee, it's just, it's a, and in the parents. Like, when the kid's smiling, the parents are smiling harder. The goal of the day is for the children to have fun with their families and for the Boys and Girls Club to give back to the community. This is the Boys and Girls Club 10th anniversary for the Family Fest and it looks like everyone is having so much fun so I thought I might as well join them. I'm Riley McManus, TVT News. So Riley having some fun there and I'll tell you who else was having some fun. It is a life-changing day for Thunder Bay's Pache family. They're now multi-millionaires after winning this month's Hospital Foundation 50-50 draw, taking home the largest grand prize in the lottery's history. Health Sciences Foundation CEO Glenn Craig gave them the news this morning. Do you have plans for New Year's Eve? Uh, just spending it quietly with our family. Well, if I told you you just won $2,530,500, would that change your plans a bit? Um, are you serious? I'm not the kind of guy to joke around with something this big. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, the family just walked past the 50-50 pop-up shop at the Inner City Shopping Centre yesterday, dreaming about how nice it would be to return the following day to collect the prize. And today that dream became a reality. They say they buy tickets every month in order to give back to the hospital. I purchased the tickets just to give back to the hospital. They've been so wonderful to our family. And um, I just wanted to, it was something I wanted to donate to. I never ever in a million years thought I would actually win the money. I was just trying to be just a, good a good person to give to the hospital really. Yeah. So, I mean, that's really and it. It's nice that the money's matched and it goes to a good cause. For sure. And we're happy I mean, to be a part of it. Just hearing Natalie and her family's story today, um, moved me to tears to be quite honest. I was a kid on Christmas Eve last night, couldn't sleep, just wanting to find out who our winner was, hoping we were going to have a great story and I don't think we could have asked for any better story than what we heard today. Well, the 50-50 draw has generated more than 15 million dollars for the hospital since its inception. Fiona, I can't even imagine uh, how nice a phone call that was to, to receive that news today. Yeah, and all I've got to offer is nice weather. <laughs> we'll take I it. I feel like such a letdown. <laughs> uh, today we had temperatures moving in reverse. We started the day in the pre-dawn hours at zero Celsius and temperatures have been falling ever since down to a low of minus 
5 at this hour. Wind chills sitting around minus 11. And that's with winds from the west-southwest ranging from 19 to 32 kilometers per hour throughout the day and very gray skies. So kind of a, a quiet gray day to end the week with. But we're not the only ones that saw temperatures fall pretty much throughout the day. Fort Francis currently at their low of minus 13, although it's under clear skies and that's going to set the stage for a very cool night there. Cooler temperatures also in Red Lake at minus 14. They've had light snow for much of the day. That's going to taper off over the next few hours. It actually warms up a little bit as you head further east because all that cooler air is coming from the western uh, parts of the continent. So we're looking at minus 8 in Armstrong, minus 6 in Greenstone, although uh, wind chills feel a little closer to about minus 11 at this time. Marathon, minus 1, and Sault Ste. Marie on the plus side at 2 Celsius under cloudy skies. Here in the city of Thunder Bay, we are going to see a much cooler night tonight than we have for the last little bit. Uh, low of minus 15 under mainly clear skies. Remember, when clouds dissipate, dissipate all the heat that is trapped below closer to uh, the ground just kind of dissipates and it just gets a lot colder at night in the winter. So minus 15, a wind chill of minus 18, but that doesn't mean things are going to be colder during the day for the next little while. It's going to be uh, continuing mild conditions through most of northwestern Ontario for the next few days. I'll have more details later on in the news hour. Okay, thanks a lot, Fiona. Well, there was an OPP procession through southern Ontario today as the body of fallen officer Greg Pashala was transported from Toronto to his hometown of Barrie. We'll have all the details as your Friday news hour continues. This call was a simple call. Uh, it just, uh, as our commissioner has said, this, this shouldn't have happened.